Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we will continue speaking about uh, uh, usability testing. We will conclude this this topic from a let's say theoretical point of view, um, and then on Monday we will have an exercise. So I think we stopped. here on tasks. So yesterday we have seen a very brief introduction to the uh, usability testing topic. Then we have seen a set of uh, steps that we should consider in when planning a usability test. And again, the planning phase it's probably, is probably the most important one. So you have to first uh, plan about your participants, uh, your roles in the, in the test. Um, you have to define tasks and today we will start uh, exploring in more detail how to define tasks for usability testing. You have to choose also uh, methodology and so on. And the last point is probably um, yeah, the script, the written protocol that it's very important for consistency among sessions. So today uh, we are going to explore some of these uh, steps in more detail and let's start with, with tasks. Um, you already know uh, something about, about tasks. Actually, you already defined three tasks that you will use in heuristic evaluation. Um, but we can also uh, specify some tasks specifically for usability testing. And as we have seen yesterday, these tasks are typically, um, typically include also a scenario, right? So here, rather than simply ordering the user to perform an action on the system um, with no explanation, it's better to situate the request within a, a scenario. Um, and the scenario, let's say, sets the stage, sets the limits of the interaction between the user and, and the system. And also explain why the user is performing a given, a given operation. Um, so as in the example of yesterday, you need to provide some context. For example, yesterday uh, we saw these users with all is devices and services that can be controlled by the user uh, to define some, some kind of automation. So uh, you provide some context um, so that the user can engage with the tool uh, by impersonating the user described in the scenario. And here are, I listed three uh, suggestions for um, developing a good task for usability testing. And the first suggestion is to make the task uh, realistic. Okay? So let's suppose that we have this goal uh, that is browse product offerings and purchase an item on a, an e-commerce website, for example. And I listed here uh, two possible tasks. One can be defined as a, a poor task and the other it's probably better. Uh, and the poor task, let's imagine that we are uh, on an e-commerce website for running shoes. And the poor task is purchase a pair of orange Nike running shoes. Why is it a poor task in your opinion? And let's compare it with, with the better task, that is buy a pair of shoes for less than $40. Why the first one is probably a poor task with respect to the second one. in your opinion. Sorry? Uh, yeah, exactly. So in the first task, you are in some ways fixing a constraint. Um, so I would like to buy uh, a very specific pair of running shoes, orange color, and also the brand. So we are preventing the user uh, 
uh, from exploring the, the website and the catalog of, of running shoes in this case. The second one, it's probably better because the, par the participant can, for example, compare products based on his or her own criteria, right? Uh, and also the constraint, the only constraint here is about the budget. Uh, that is probably a more realistic constraint with respect to the color of, of running shoes, especially. You don't buy running shoes based on the color, typically, but probably based on the technical characteristics of, of the shoes. But again, it's a better task because you can allow users to explore the website in a more generic way. So you can see if there are uh, usability problems uh, in your system, in your e-commerce website more, more easily in this case. So first suggestion, realistic. Second suggestion, make the task actionable. Um, so it's best to ask the users to do an action uh, rather than asking the user how she would do it. For example, let's suppose that the user goal is to uh, find a movie and, and show times by exploiting some kind of digital interfaces. Again, I listed a poor and a better task. The poor task is uh, you want to see a movie Sunday afternoon, go to this given website uh, and tell me where you would click next. And the better task is instead use the website to find a movie you would be interested in seeing on Sunday afternoon. Why this one is poor and why this one is better, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, with the better task, we can also understand what are the interests of, of the no, user. Okay, so with the better task, we can understand if the application really uh, allow users to find uh, a movie. Uh, yeah, this is uh, probably a reason. And the other reason is that uh, the first task, the poor task, is rather a question, right? So there is the risk that the user will answer with, 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 uh, with word, by a voice, right? By telling you uh, the action to be performed, right? But we are interested in the real action on the platform. So this is the reason why uh, tasks should be actionable. So we should uh, encourage the user to perform the action on the system rather than answering to a question via voice, right? Third suggestion, uh, avoid giving clues and describing the steps. And I think this is a more obvious suggestion. So let's suppose that we have this goal, look up for our grades. Um, and the poor task here is you want to see the results of your midterm exams go to a given website, the Polytechnico website, sign in and tell me where you would click next to get your transcript. And the better task is instead more generic. Look up the results of your midterm exams by exploiting the, the website, the Polytechnico website. So here in the poor task, we are probably suggesting in some ways uh, the specific steps that are uh, required for completing the task. Um, so it's better to uh, avoid this kind of, of suggestions. Here we are suggesting that, for example, you must log in uh, as the first step, then you have to click something. And so we are suggesting how to complete the task in a way. It's better to be more generic and allow users to explore freely the, uh, the interface. Um, Another source of bias uh, is when you define tasks that in the description include terms that are used in the interface. Um, for example, if you tell the user to click on a given item, 
on a menu, uh, you won't learn if that specific item, uh, specific label is meaningful for the user, for example. Um, so just to make an example, uh, let's suppose that we are interested in uh, understanding if users uh, can sign up for the newsletter of our website, okay? And in our interface, we maybe have a big button with a label, sign up for our weekly newsletter. Is it a good task, in your opinion, for example, sign up for the weekly newsletter? If then, in our interface, we have a big button with sign up for a newsletter, it's probably not a good task because we are using the same label of the button inside the task description. Okay, so we are suggesting what to click. Uh, so what would be a better task in this case? Uh, still, we are using some terms that are included in the button. Yeah, something like that, or maybe find some ways to receive uh, weekly information via email, for example. Something more general that uh, doesn't include any, any word that are included in, in the interface, it's probably better. Okay. Um, and as we said yesterday, when we have defined these tasks, uh, we should also uh, understand how we can define success and failure criteria for, this, for these tasks. Um, and also we can collect during the running phase of the study different kind of metrics. And we must plan which metrics we need uh, and which metrics we want to collect. So uh, we can have, again, subjective metrics that are collected directly uh, from the users. Uh, so subjective metrics are questions uh, for, for your participants and can be uh, collected in different, during different stages of the session uh, before the session starts, like background information, uh, after each task uh, is completed um, and also at the end of the study like to collect the overall ease of use of the interface, the satisfaction, and also some, the likelihood to use or recommend the interface to other people. These are all examples of uh, subjective, subjective metrics that you can collect at the end of the study. But as we have seen yesterday, we can also have uh, more quantitative usability tests so you can collect uh, quantitative metrics uh, during these uh, sessions. Uh, obviously, these are metrics related, always related to the usability of uh, the interface. Uh, here we are not collecting metrics to demonstrate the impact of the application on the behavior of the user. This is something that probably you cannot uh, test in, a, in the lab, but you need probably a in the wild test but are still quantitative metrics related to the interaction between the user and the system. Uh, and here are some examples, uh, like successful completion rates, error rates, time on task. Let's see an example. Um, so yesterday I've shown to you this example. No, it's not here, it's here. About... Um, this conversational agent to define trigger action rules, right? Let me see if I can find. Okay, uh, so this example about this conversational agent to define trigger action rules for automating the behavior of devices connected to the internet and online services like social network uh, and messaging application. And in this work, in this research work, we conducted a usability study. Um, and if I can go to the right slide, let me... Okay, this one. And during this study, we collected different metrics 
that are summarized in this table extracted from the paper that we published for this work. Um, and as you can see, there are some quantitative metrics that were collected uh, automatically. Here, the logs. Uh, so we uh, introduced in the conversational agent some software to automatically measure, for example, uh, the number of messages exchanged between the user and the platform, or to collect the, the messages ex exchanged between the user and the platform, for example, to understand uh, the level of abstraction adopted by the user, so in which details the user communicated with with the, with the platform. Okay, so maybe some user uh, refer to specific devices and services. Uh, maybe some other users use a more abstract level of abstraction without referring to specific devices. So we try to uh, explore this this level of abstraction. Then we also add some uh, still quantitative metrics, but collected directly from the users through some questionnaires based on uh, some question uh, based on Likert scale. So we collected, for example, the perceived recommendation quality of the suggestion received by the users at the end of the study with a questionnaire, and also the perceived effectiveness and fun in using the system at the end of the study. And we used two validated questionnaires that we extracted from some previous work. And here you have a reference. So it's a structured way to, to get some feedback on a specific aspect, like the perceived recommendation quality. And finally, we also uh, had a debriefing session with our users. And in this debriefing uh, session, we asked some open questions to mainly investigate the perceived advantages and disadvantages uh, of using the system. Okay? So different kind of quantitative and subjective qualitative metrics that we collected in, in this study. OK, and here I tried to summarize uh, the most common uh, metrics that you can collect in a usability test. And the first three metrics are typically always used. Uh, successful task completion, critical errors, and non-critical errors. And these three metrics are actually linked together in a way. Um, <clears throat> So successful task completion, a task is successfully completed when the participant indicates uh, they have found the answer or completed the task goal. So the task is finished when the participant stops interacting with your, with your tool and tell you, OK, I finish. Um, and again, to measure this success, you can have different uh, strategies. Uh, we will see some examples. Uh, we can have a Boolean metric, OK? Uh, it has been finished with success without any errors or not. Or you can have also different levels of success. Uh, for example, you can use a, a scale for measuring the level of successful task completion. Uh, relatedly, you have uh, critical errors and, and not critical errors. So critical errors are deviations at completion from the target of the task, so that the participant cannot finish the task. Participant may or may not be aware that the task goal is incorrect or incomplete, uh, but having this kind of critical errors uh, prevents the user from successfully completing the task. Um, so. Uh, these kind of errors are similar to the usability catastrophe that we have seen in the heuristic evaluation. Uh, if there is a critical error, uh, the, the task cannot be successfully completed. Um, and here, you typically have a, an absolute number to measure critical errors, right? So in performing this task, this user has made three critical errors, for example. Um, it's not the user that is uh, 
making some errors in, is the interface that uh, obviously uh, made some, some errors. So errors are always in the interface, not on the user side. Um, then you also have non-critical errors, uh, errors that are recovered by the participant during the, the execution of the task and that don't result in the participant ability to successfully complete the task. Uh, these errors only result in the task being completed less efficiently. Okay, so non-critical errors are errors that the user can recover. Maybe these errors influ will influence the uh, time needed to complete the task, but still the user, even, if, uh, even with these errors, can complete successfully the task. So if we refer to the heuristic evaluation, these are prob probably cosmetic errors or low priority errors. And also in, the, in this case, uh, you typically have an absolute number that indicates how many non-critical errors are present in your interface for the specific task. Okay, then you can have the error free rate. Again, it's also linked uh, to the other metrics. That is the percentage of participants who complete the task without any errors. So you have maybe 10 participants performing the task number one and five participants completed the task 100% successfully. Okay, so you have a 50% uh, error rate free, right? Uh, and it's typically a relative number. Then you have the time on task. Also, this metric is very common. Uh, the amount of time it takes uh, the participant to complete the task. And it's a time metric. And this is a classical example of a metric that is collected nearly always automatically with some code in your prototype, in your interface. Um, otherwise, the, the observator must measure this time manually, but it's probably better to have some automatic feature, some logging feature for this metric. Then, as we have seen in the example, we can have subjective measures that are self-reported measures uh, that are given by the participants. Uh, typically, you exploit some validated questionnaires, some state-of-the-art scales uh, for a variety of aspects related to the usability of your system and to the interaction between users and your system. Uh, so you can measure satisfaction, ease of use, uh, usability, as we will see in an example, uh, and, and so on. And finally, uh, again, this is a specific case of subjective uh, metrics. Uh, in the debriefing session, you can ask uh, what the user liked the most about the system, what the user liked at least, any recommendation for improving your system, so open-ended questions uh, in a debriefing session. Typically, uh, this is a free text uh, uh, metric and can also be asked verbally, obviously. And again, there are reliable and validated questionnaires, uh, both for subjective and uh, quantitative measures, and also for open-ended questions. Okay, let's focus on measuring success. That is the most common metric here. Um, so task success or completion is one of the uh, most common metric in usability testing. And again, in its simplest form, it's a binary metric. Uh, so the task has been completed without errors. The task has not been completed. But how can we account for partial success? We can obviously define different levels of success depending on our task and on our uh, system, on our interface. Um, so we need to plan uh, this kind of uh, levels of success. And here is an example. So the task, let's suppose that the task is, uh, you have to use the Polytechnico website, probably the version of uh, the website for instructor, but anyway, you have to book a room for your lecture, uh, a room of a given size in a given date 
and for a certain amount of time by exploiting the website of Politecnico. Uh, can you define some levels of success here? So let's start with 100% complete. When is the task completed with success? Yeah, exactly. When the user booked the room with all the constraints, it's probably 100% success. So I'm able to book a room of a given size in a given date uh, and for a certain amount of time. So I can do the, the lesson. Okay, if we, if our users, if our user book a room with a wrong size, is the task failed or is the task uh, Yeah, if it's oversized, it's not a problem. You are only wasting some, some space. So if, he, if the user uh, does some mistake for a given parameter, it, it's probably still a success, right? We can consider still the task completed, completed with some errors, but it's still completed, right? And what about uh, an operation during which the user uh, make a mistake about uh, the date. It's probably failed, right? Because it's a very big problem because you cannot do the, the lesson, right? So again, it's, it's subjective, obviously. It depends on your task and on your system. But here I tried to list four different levels of success. Again, complete success is the user booked the room with no errors, exactly as specified. Success with one minor, minor issue. This could be the second level of success. The user booked the room but select a wrong sides, as your colleague said. Uh, then you, you can have success with a major issue. The user booked the room but enters the wrong date or amount of time. Uh, the task is still completed, right? So the user booked a room, uh, so probably the user will, uh, will say, okay, I finished. Uh, so the task is completed, but with a major issue. And then there is the failure level. So the user is not able to book the room. It's, it's stuck on the interface and cannot uh, book the room. So this is an example of four possible levels of success in this case. Again, the, these levels depends on your task and on your system. But if you have this kind of levels, you can then report the levels of success of your interface. Um, for example, by reporting the percentage of users, of participants, who were at a given level. So here, for example, um, if out of 10 users, uh, 35 completed the task with a minor issue, you would say that 35% of your users were able to complete the task with a, with a minor issue. And based on this number, you can also uh, perform some, some reasoning, like in this figure extracted from the Nissan Norman group. Based on this result, we expect that 26% and 45% of our general population will complete the task with a minor error. So you can try to generalize your finding uh, and try to understand uh, how your finding will generalize in production. Okay? Okay, this was about measure, measuring success. Uh, then let's see some more details on some questionnaires that you can use sorry, for collecting metrics um, after a single task or when the test is finished. Um, again, you have some validated questionnaires for these purposes. And in this case, this is a validated questionnaire uh, for asking questions uh, after each task. Okay? Uh, it's called post-task questionnaire, I would say that it's rarely used, but anyway, it's validated, it's readable. 
Uh, obviously, this kind of questionnaires at the end of a task uh, must be short. Uh, otherwise, there is the risk of negatively uh, impacting the flow of using the system during, during the, the session. And in fact, this questionnaire is composed by a single question. Um, a single question that asks the user to rate the difficulty of the activity they just completed. Uh, on a Likert scale, scale, seven points from very easy to very difficult. Okay? So just a single question that you can use at the end of each task. It's validated, it's reliable, uh, and you can use it. But again, uh, this kind of questionnaires uh, at the end of each task are rarely used, I would say. It's more common to have some questionnaires at the end of the test, of course. So when the test is finished, when the user uh, completed all the tasks, you can use some validated questionnaires to extract sub quantitative subjective measures. And this is probably the most common uh, questionnaire for this purpose, uh, the uh, system usability scale. Okay? Um, and it's nearly always used uh, in usability testing, this questionnaire. Um, according to the creator of this uh, questionnaire, that is John Brook, um, the questionnaire was created, it's quite old, was created in 1986. It's a quick and dirt usability scale. It's quick and dirt because it's based on the subjective feedback of the user but it's still trustable, okay? And it measures the perceived usability of a system, okay? It doesn't measure the usability of the system in general, of course, but it's the usability perceived by the user after having using uh, the system. Um, it's uh, composed of 10 questions on a on a, um, and each question is uh, based on a um, Likert scale of five points. Um, so each question has five response options. Um, so a Likert scale from one strongly disagree to five uh, strongly agree. So each question is uh, actually a sentence and the user must select uh, an option, one to five, that says, okay, I strongly agree with this sentence, or five, I strongly disagree with this, with this sentence. The questionnaire produces a score from zero to 10. Uh, it's not equivalent to a percentage score. We will see in a minute how you can calculate the score of this questionnaire. Uh, but there is also an empirical threshold here that is 68. So a score above 68 is considered above average. So if you receive uh, a SAS score below 68, it's probably a problem. Uh, you should try to refine something in your design. If you receive uh, a SAS score of 80, 90, you are probably in the top 10% uh, of all the websites in the web, okay? So there is this empirical threshold. And these are the questions that again are actually sentences. So, first sentence. I think that I would like to use this system frequently. Okay, I've tried it in this test and I, would like, I think I would like to use it frequently. Second question, I found the system unnecessarily complex. Then I thought the system was easy to use. I think that I would need the support of a technical person to be able to use the system. And this is a problem, of course. I found the various functions in this system were, ve were sorry, well integrated. I thought there was too much inconsistency in this system. I would imagine that most people would learn to use this system very quickly. So it's easy to learn, learnability. I found the system very cumbersome to use. I felt very confident using the system. And finally, I needed to learn a lot of things before I could get going with this system. These are the 10 sentences that uh, the user must answer. Do you notice something strange, particular, in this list of questions? Some of them, uh, when you use the smart score, it's the best, but rather when you use smart score, it's the 
okay, some of them are positive and some of them are negative, right? And actually there is a pattern. The odd numbered questions are always positive and the other questions are always negative, okay? And this is to avoid biases, obviously. So the score computation takes this into account. Uh, yeah, obviously all the questions depends on the system and you can also try to contextualize the, the questions to the system that you are evaluating. Uh, but typically if you use the system frequently it's probably a positive aspect of your system, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so uh, your colleague is saying that obviously if you uh, test your system um, with a user that doesn't have the motivation to use the system in the real world, probably the answer to this positive question would be uh, five, for example. Uh, obviously when you are testing, uh, as we said yesterday, when you are planning a usability study, you would also need to plan the participants uh, that you are going to recruit. Uh, so then you can make some distinctions, some comparison between users that have a strong motivation and users that have uh, no motivation at all to use the system, of course. But again, if you receive a positive answer to this question from some users that, uh, in theory, don't have this strong motivation to use the system, this is probably a confirmation of your, of your, uh, of your system and of your design. Okay, so to calculate the score of your system, there is, an al let's say, an algorithm. It is this one. Uh, and you can use this slide to calculate your, uh, the score of your system usability scales if you are going to use them. In, in, to use it in the assignment 6. So each answer is 1 to 5, right? So uh, x. And you should calculate the score as follows. For every odd numbered question, so the positive questions, you should subtract 1 from the score. So x minus 1. For example, if the answer for question 1 is 4, its score is 3. Okay. Then for every even numbered question, you should subtract the score from 5. So 5 minus x. So for example, if the answer for question 2, that is a negative sentence, is 4, its score is 1. Okay? Then you should sum the scores of all the questions. And then you should multiply the total by 2.5. Okay? This is the algorithm proposed by uh, the creator of the questionnaire that takes into account this difference between negative and positive questions and try to avoid biases in the answer of, of the participant. Advantages and disadvantages of this questionnaire. Um, this questionnaire is reliable. It has been evaluated, it has been used for decades, and several experiments have demonstrated that um, the results that you can, the feedback that you can get with these questionnaires are similar to the feedback that you can get with more complex and costly methods. And it's really free and quick and simple to use. You just have to take these sentences, maybe change your system with the name of your tool, and that's it. Uh, it's quite used in industry um, and you can apply it to uh, a wide range of technologies. Uh, you can use it if you are evaluating a mobile application, uh, a website, a conversational agent and so on. There are also, however, disadvantages. Uh, it's of course a subjective measure. 
so you are measuring the perceived usability. Uh, so it should not be your only method, of course. But as we have learned, you will probably conduct multiple evaluations during the design process. And more importantly, it gives no clues about how to improve the score. Uh, so it's not diagnostic. I mean, if I receive a good SAS score, okay, I know that I'm doing good, but in what? I don't know what are the problems, right? And consequently, it's not possible to make systematic comparisons between two systems and their uh, SAS scores. Okay, so uh, if, you com if you have two websites, your website and the website of a competitor, uh, you ask your participants, your users, to evaluate both the websites and you receive two SAS scores. So maybe your website has a score of 80, and the, the competitor website has a score of uh, 70, uh, you cannot absolutely say that your website is better than the other. Okay? So you cannot make this kind of, of comparison. So don't even try to compare SAS scores of different systems. Okay? We know that both the websites are above the average threshold. That's it. We cannot compare the two, val the two values. Okay, SAS questionnaire, nearly always used. Then there are other kind of questionnaires that can be used at the end of the session to measure some spe specific aspects of the interaction between users and the system. The SAS is more generic. It's about usability in general. And this is an example, uh, the NASA TLX. Uh, it was created by the aerospace company in the US. Uh, in 1980 um, and it's the result of uh, the efforts of the company to develop a tool to measure the perceived workload uh, required by the complex highly technical tasks of aerospace crew members so it's a um, questionnaire specifically designed to measure the perceived workload in performing the tasks with your with your system um, it's typically used and it's useful for studying complex products. So this is the reason why uh, it's uh, not so common as the system usability scale. And also it's used in uh, dangerous environments like aerospace, healthcare, and military. Okay? So it measures the perceived workload, so how much stress the system is putting on the user, uh, how much cognitive load uh, it's required for completing the tasks with the given system and, and so on. And it's also uh, really difficult to be adopted and it's difficult actually to calculate the score. Um, it's composed of six questions that are however based on a 21 point scale. So it's difficult also for the user to rate each, each question. Uh, and 21 point scale ranging from very low to very, to very high. And each question addresses one dimension of the perceived workload. So the first question addresses the mental demand, then we have the physical demand, time pressure, perceived success with the task, overall effort level and frustration level. So here probably you can probably read the questions. The first question probably is how mentally demanding was the task from very low to very high on a 21 point scale. So mental demand. So respondents weighed each of uh, each questions uh, for each category um, and then you can calculate the score. Um, actually it's quite complex to calculate this score uh, NASA shares a paper and pencil version with some instructions. You can follow this link. And there is also a free iOS app to compute the score. So if you're going to use this questionnaire, you can use these uh, references to compute uh, the score. Any questions about questionnaires?
You can obviously also define some, some questionnaires, uh, some custom questionnaires. You can ask some custom questions uh, to extract more feedback. Uh, then, of course, if you have your own questionnaire, it's difficult to uh, compare results with other, with other, um, with other systems and other evaluations, right? And also, if you use a validated questionnaire, you know that it's validated, right? For example, by using the system usability scale, you know that there is this uh, validated threshold that you can use, okay? So on a research paper, on an industry report, you can validate your results, you can motivate your results by referring to well-known uh, thresholds. Obviously, if you define your own questionnaire, you cannot, uh, it's, it's more a qualitative analysis, right? Okay, let's speak about methodology. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, you can have a free usability study during which you simply ask your participants to perform the task without any particular methodology and you observe your user. But you can also adopt, uh, typically for a subset of tasks, some methodology. Some methodology that will be uh, used by the users themselves. Uh, and the first methodology is, uh, the first common methodology, uh, it's very common in usability testing and in ACI, is think aloud. This is the definition given by the Nielsen Norman group. In a thinking aloud test, you ask your participant to use the system while continuously thinking out loud. That is, simply verbalizing their thoughts as they move through the user interface, okay? Uh, and you can really get some useful insights, some useful feedback from this methodology. Um, think aloud can also be retroactive in some cases, so ask it after the task, the session, but in this case, it's difficult to remember everything for the user. So it's typically used during the execution of, of the task. So according to the Nielsen Norman group, uh, to run a task with Think Aloud, you just need to do three things. Uh, recruit your participant, give your participant a representative task to be performed, and then shut up and let the users do the talking. Let's see an example that explains better the methodology. It's a video extracted from the Nissen Norman Group website. No internet, wow, sorry. Okay. I don't know if the, uh, the audio works, but anyway. Uh, this is an example of a participant that is trying this, this website, uh, trying to perform a task. We don't know the task, but anyway. No, the audio doesn't work. Let me try. Um, let me try this.
Let me check the recording. Uh, it's still ongoing. Yes. OK, so you can also uh, rewatch the video on your own, but it's a very simple method. It's the user describing the interaction uh, while she is interacting with, with the system. Obviously, it's not mandatory to use something like this, this methodology, for all the tasks. Why, in your opinion? Okay, exactly. It depends from the metrics that you are collecting. This is true. So it's useful, obviously, for understanding the, the patterns that the user is using in exploring your, your interface, the preferences of the users, uh, any misunderstandings, and so on. But obviously, if you are measuring the time, and the task is time sensitive, so you are interested in measuring the time needed to complete the task, this methodology may influence your results, right? Because it takes time for the user to thinking out loud, of course. So this is the reason why this methodology is typically adopted for one specific task in the usability test, uh, and then for the other tasks. Uh, you don't adopt any particular methodology. So you can also define tasks to be specifically to be uh, performed with this methodology. Advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it's cheap. You don't need special equipment. You simply sit next to your user and, take, and you take notes um, as he or she is talking. Um, it's also simple, it requires little expertise, and it's robust. You can still also get some reasonable uh, feedback, some reasonable findings, even if you make some mistakes in running the study, okay? So for example, even if you maybe give some suggestions to the user uh, during uh, the task, you still can extract some feedback thanks to uh, the, the talking of the user. And this is not true typically for quantitative usability studies. So if you are only measuring the time, for example, without any qualitative feedback, and you introduce some, some bias by suggest, suggesting something to your user, then the time will be probably negatively influenced by your suggestions, but you cannot know if there is a bias or not. Instead, if, if you collect some qualitative feedback, if you record the participants talking uh, with the interface, you can still get some, some feedback, even if you introduce some noise. Uh, and as your colleague was saying before, uh, it can also show how the system is actually used, so you understand how the user is using your system. So, for example, you can understand the preferences of your user uh, and, and so on. There are also disadvantages. Uh, it's obviously uh, an unnatural situation, so most people don't sit and talk to themselves uh, all day, typically. So it's quite unnatural. It, again, subject to biases. Uh, so by exploiting this methodology, participants will ask you for sure some, some questions. And there is this risk of giving uh, suggestions. Um, and obviously, suggestions can very easily change the behavior of the user. Um, and it's also subject to filtered statements. Um, so uh, most people, uh, including us probably, want to appear smart, obviously. And so there is the risk that the user won't speak until she completed the task. OK, let me complete the task, and then I will explain to you how I successfully completed it. So there is this risk of uh, filtered statements. Um, 
and also again the act of describing something may alter uh, the task performance especially when we have some time sensitive tasks so probably uh, at the beginning of uh, the usability test of the session we should also train our participant on how to conduct effectively and efficiently the task with this specific uh, methodology to avoid, for example, this problem of filtered statements. So the user should speak continuously. Then there is a variation of uh, Think Aloud that is cooperative uh, evaluation. Um, that is Think Aloud, but during, through this methodology, the participant and the facilitator can collaborate during the task. Uh, so both can ask each other questions. So the participant can ask some questions to the facilitator and the facilitator can ask some questions maybe to clarify a given behavior to the user, to the participant. And especially in this case, uh, there is this risk of introducing bias and so when you use cooperative evaluation, typically the facilitator is not part of the design team. Okay, so doesn't know very well how the system works. So the facilitator and the participant cooperate to solve the task with the interface. There are some additional advantages in using this technique. Uh, it's less constrained and easier to use. Um, the user can be encouraged to criti criticize the system by the facilitator and clarification is possible, obviously. Okay? So these were two methodologies that you can adopt in your um, usability testing sessions and they are also actually, I think, the two most common methods used uh, in XCI for this kind of evaluation. Then, equipment. Um, again, we already uh, saw some aspects of this point uh, yesterday, but you will probably need some equipment to conduct your study, so you need to plan which equipment you will need. Um, so, for example, usability tests are typically video and audio recorded. Uh, for later analysis, so you will probably need some software, some, some hardware to uh, record audio and video and also, you, you may also want to record the screen, right, of your, uh, of your system, of, of the PC on which the user is trying the, the system, right? So if the user is testing a website on your PC you will probably have some software that records the entire screen for later analysis. Uh, so here I listed some material that you will probably need, some paper and pencil. Uh, you can also base your studies just on paper uh, and observations, um, but it's probably a limited uh, a cheap and limited solution. So in this case, uh, observations are limited to the writing speed of the observators. You can, again, record audio, record video. Uh, when you have Think Aloud, uh, you typically record audio for later analysis. Um, if you video record something, this may be obtrusive and you will probably need some more items in the informed consent form for the privacy. Uh, computer login, uh, we have already seen this, this feature. You can also have some special material uh, like eye tracking, for example, to track and record the movements of the eye of the participant. So, for example, with eye tracking, you can understand, for example, how users are searching information in your, in your web page, for example. And based on these findings, you can then rearrange the position of your buttons, items, and so on. Uh, because you know how users will search in your, in your web page, for example. And you can, you typically have a mixed use in practice. Okay? So 
you may mix this kind of equipments and, and strategies. Then here, if you want some references, some advice on how to write a good script to avoid uh, biases among sessions, you can use this, these references if you want. Okay, we are in the last part of usability tests, run and analyze, that are the two steps after the planning. Um, again, especially the run phase, it's really easy if you planned carefully your test. So the first thing to do uh, is to get the informed consent. And it's better to get it in written format. So again, if the user doesn't sign your consent form, you cannot do the study. Um, then, one person um, acts as the facilitator and the rest of the team are observers. And at least one of the observers must take notes. Okay, so you can record anything, you can log uh, whatever you want, but still one observer should take notes during the study. And it's also very important before starting the study, uh, you should tell each participant, we are testing our app and not you, and any mistakes are a fault of the app uh, and not yours. This is very important. Uh, and it will also be included probably in the informed consent form, but it's better to repeat this sentence before starting the session. Then, the facilitator in the running phase should always follow the script uh, without introducing additional information, for example. Uh, it should remain neutral, not helping the participants, and, and it should provide clear instructions. Uh, again, tasks can be given in uh, a written format, one at a time, or vocally. Uh, the facilitator must also explain participants how to use a given methodology, if any, um, at the right moment. So, for example, the facilitator should explain to the participants how the Think Aloud work uh, and for which tasks to use it. Um, okay, of course, note takers take notes of the participant behavior uh, and also they take notes about comments, errors uh, during the interaction between the participant and the system. And the system obviously must be ready to measure all the defined criteria, especially for uh, the metrics that you are going to collect automatically. And finally, there is uh, the analyzing phase. So you try to put all together, you analyze the collected data to find uh, failures in your design and also ways to improve it, them. Uh, so probably during the study, you will get some feedback from your users, uh, not only on problems, but also on possible ways to, to improve these problems, to overcome these problems. Uh, and so you start analyzing your written notes, your audio, your video, your usage logs, and this takes time, obviously. Um, do not forget to consider all the collected metrics per task and overall. And, of course, quantitative data can be summarized, right? So, for example, for the system usability scale, you calculate the score for each participant and then you calculate the average uh, value of your score. And you can do the same for success rate, task time, error rates, then you can do some statistical analysis between your, your data and so on. And your goal is to look for trends and keep count of problems that occurred across participants. Maybe there is a problem that occurred only just with one participant, maybe there are other problems that are very common, so they are probably high priority with respect to the, to the other one to be fixed. Okay? And uh, again, this phase uh, typically takes time because you have, for example, to rewatch all the sessions that you have recorded uh, and you cannot typically uh, rewatch 
the sessions at a double speed, as you may probably, as you do for, for the video lectures, for example, probably. Because you have to extract feedback from, from the videos, so you need to carefully reanalyze all your collected data. Okay? And that's it. We finished a little bit earlier, but if you have any questions, uh, otherwise, see you on Friday for assignment five. Thank you.